talk about web programming, which is weird because I'm totally a back-end developer. However, once in a while, I really do want to make a web page. And in the past, I've like attempted to do this, and as soon as I get into JavaScript, and I keep getting undefined, it's not a function, and this property's not defined, and I'm like, oh, I can't do this, and I go back to the back end. <laughs> but now we have Elm. How many people are familiar with Elm? Most of you, okay. So I'll skip like some of the super intro stuff. Um, also, you understand a lot, how many people know Haskell? A ridiculous number, okay. <laughs> so I don't really have to talk about the syntax. What matters is about Elm is that I get rid of errors. And by errors, I exclusively mean runtime exceptions. I'm not talking about bugs, you can always have bugs. The types help you some with the bugs, but X and Y are both integers and I totally get them mixed up. But still, I never get undefined, it's not a function, and I'm super happy. I can live with that. Um, and without too much typing is the other trade-off that's interesting in this talk. And by typing, I totally mean finger typing. That's what I don't wanna do. I don't wanna do like changes in five places for one conceptual change, but that's totally necessary in Elm because it's purely functional and completely explicit. And I like that, except when it means too much typing. But I totally don't mean too much static typing because I don't think there really is such a thing. Uh, at least not at this conference. Um, and Elm has a lot of static typing, not as much as Haskell, but way more than JavaScript. So it's a big improvement. In this talk, I'm gonna do some live coding. The good news is you can use this stuff now and some of the rest of it soon. Elm is in production in dozens of companies. I made that number up. You can tell because it's really vague. <laughs> uh, but it has its own conference and so it must be real. <laughs> Elm, you, Elm is like totally legit and you can use it in your apps and you can use it in part of your apps or you can use it in all of your apps. Um, and I'm also going to talk about some code editors from Atomist and those are, well the good news is you can use them in any language. You don't even have to switch to a different language. The bad news is they'll be open sourced in a month or two. All right. Let's get to work. Oh, oh, right, and I work at Stripe, and at Stripe, I work in the back end, and I totally don't work in Elm. I work in Ruby. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, but Stripe is awesome, and uh, we sponsored the conference, and I'm super happy about that. Okay, if nothing else out of this talk, I want you to get something about the trade-offs being made and uh, how we can think about those and how we can make them not painful. Of course, on the spectrum of do we want our errors at runtime or at compile time, Elm falls, falls very far on the compile time spectrum. At any other conference, I would have it all the way at the right, but we've seen Idris and Agda here, so <laughs> let's be a little more reasonable. What matters is uh, once my Elm compiles, it's going to run in the browser, it's going to do something. Chances are decent it's going to do what I wanted it to do. Uh, unlike JavaScript, where you can run absolutely anything, but chances are, are a lot of those things don't work. The other trade-off, and in work, I really, really appreciate this one, is the difference between ease of writing and ease of reading. And I don't mean reading like English, like cucumber tests or something, I mean reading like code. I don't want my code to read like English, I want it to be code. And I wanna know exactly what it's doing at every function call, and I get that in Elm. Um, for instance, Elm has monads, but it does not have the generic monad. It has list, dot list and maybe and all the like normal useful monads. And if you want to map over a list, you call list.map. And I can tell exactly where that function is defined and I can go to the code and look at it if I need to. Uh, there's no implicits. So Scala is also way over here where you can make macros and you can uh, make implicits and all kinds of other magic to make it look really cool when you're writing it. And by you, I mean you specifically the one who wrote or imported and studied that library. I don't mean me who comes back and maintains it later. And in some of the Ruby code that I, I read at Stripe, I look at it and I'm like, how is this even executable? And I have no idea. And I mean, I, I dig for a little while, but there's so many gems and layers and layers of gems and what all code is loaded, I, I just ask somebody. And they're like, oh yeah, we do this method missing thing over here in this class, six gems deep. <laughs> You can't do that in Elm. I mean, you can, you can have libraries, but you have to call them explicitly, and I can tell, and I'm so happy about that. The negative is that it leads to more typing, and I'm totally cool with that. So the interesting thing here is what I'll show 
with the editors, there's a language called RUG that is performing transformations on the code so that I can add a feature that requires changes in five places as one operation using code that I wrote about how to modify the code. This is a level of abstraction that's very different. Instead of making my code abstract, I've just abstracted the operation of modifying my code. It's abstraction without indirection. So whoever comes along and maintains it, they're perfectly free to change it. This is fine. Um, and they don't even have to know that I cheated. Also, haha, <laughs> automatic code editor is great for live demos. Okay, so let's have some live demo. All right, here's an empty directory except for a readme. If you've ever thought about getting started with Elm but haven't, uh, it's super easy. We'll do the simplest possible thing. Let's make hello world. And then we'll evolve this into something like maximally, well, something close to what I want. Um, you have to say module and the name of your module. And you have to say what your module exposes because we're being extremely explicit here. And then let's try main is hello world. Maybe that'll work. Because uh, main, wild. Uh, main is a constant. This is a purely functional program. Um, so main, yeah, it has no, uh, doesn't ask the state of the world. This is going to be a static page, so that, that's pretty easy. Uh, given an Elm file, you can type Elm make, and then the name of the file. Uh, make means compile. I wish it said compile, but it says make. It's not a build tool. It just compiles it into JavaScript, except, of course, that we have a bad main type. Oh, I forgot before I hit yes. Um, Elm is going, since, since this is an empty directory and I don't have like my little dependency definition, Elm is going to create it for me to make it easy, but before it changes any of my files, it asks me whether that's okay, and yes, it is okay uh, to install Elmlang virtual DOM. And now we have the pretty compile error. Um, so in the, Elm just totally like makes the trade-off less painful by making the compile errors less painful. Uh, Connor talked yesterday about how the work of making these um, error messages good isn't any fun, so nobody does it. Well, Evan does it. Evan writes Elm, and he is trying to make a language that makes coding in the browser pleasant. That is quite a challenge. But one way he does it is by trying to make these as explicit as possible. So in Elm, I kind of practice compile error-driven development. And in this one, I'm like, okay, well, I knew I needed something, so I'll just guess. And the compiler tells me that, no, you need an HTML or a graphic or a program, uh, but you gave me a string. Yes, I did give you a string. So now let's give it something more useful. What I actually want is an HTML of some text, and then I'll need to import HTML. And that should work. Good, it does work. Now, what do we have here? Uh, we have an index.html, so by default, the Elm compiler gives you like the whole HTML file because this is the quickest path from a program, from an Elm program to a web page that you can open and look at and say, ooh, ah, hello world. Uh, it also gave me a couple things. The readme was already here, but Elm package.json is like the actual definition of my code of my code, of my dependencies. So the dependencies here, one thing that's interesting is that it used a range of versions. It says anywhere between 405 and 500 is acceptable for this, li this library. Significance here, the 405 is um, the current version, and Elm is totally certain that it can use anything between there and 500 because it enforces semantic version at package publishing time. So if uh, Evan tried to publish a version of Elm Lang core as 406, uh, but it actually changed an API, that would be rejected. If it adds an API, it has to be 4.1. And if it changes or deletes the, any available method, yeah, any available function, if it changes the type of it, that's 5.0.0, because it would break compilation of, of my project. So be, at, by sub, enforcing that at publish time, it makes it easy here. And then if I import two libraries that both want, say, Elm HTML, um, Elm will find a compatible version that's in both their ranges, and if they don't overlap, I can't import both those libraries. So there's none of that ambiguity. It's very explicit. And this says that my source directory is my project root, and I'm not okay with that. 
so before I do anything else, I really want my project to look like a real project and not just a little pile of source at the root. Uh, so I'm going to use one of my editors to do that. This lets me start my project where it is as a working, working but pathetic little project. And um, Jessitron Elm template organize with a project name of code mesh and please run locally. Uh, so these are my custom editors that I have created to run locally. And this one, oh man, it doesn't like me. Okay, I can fix this. I'm going to go over to my Atomist directory and run it from there instead. This is fine. Rug edit in code elm code mesh, elm at code mesh. So run this editor on this project and the editor's name is organized. Run it in local mode, please. Um, so this editor is going to move my source into the source directory and um, change the elm package.json to match. It's going to give me a real index.html because in real life, I don't want my elm to compile to index.html. I just want to compile it to JavaScript and then I'll include that in my elm.html. So I got tired of, oh yeah, yeah, project name, blah, blah, blah. Name equals code mesh, remember it once. Um, right, I want my Elm output to Elm.js in like a target directory or something sensible, not my root directory. Uh, so this just does all that stuff. I like to start a lot of Elm projects because it's really fun to just play around with it and I get tired of organizing them all. So now I have a program that does it. There we go. Uh, commit that, uh, actually add stuff, commit that, okay. Now I have a source directory, I have a resources directory. I'm gonna copy in some stuff from above. And now my resources directory has like some graphics in it and some CSS. Um, and now we're good, okay. So now I can, I have a dot get ignore that ignores my Elm stuff and my target directory. Let's make sure I can make, uh, and, oh and I have a build script that deletes target, copies the resources into target, just those usual stuff, this is fine. Um, now, I can edit this, let's make sure it still works. Uh, oh, that's because I put it in target, right. Which is a much better place for it anyway. Okay, there's that. And now I can like do something interesting with it because I'm willing to because it's organized in a, like a real project. Okay. Let's put, okay, so my objective, the thing that I always wanted to do in Elm that kind of triggered me to like, man, I wish I could do UI development was, I would like, um, I would like to take an architecture diagram and like add labels to it and then like zoom in and add more labels and zoom in and add more labels, but it has to be infinite zoom because that's how the architecture at Stripe is. <laughs> Nothing else is deep enough. Um, and so t we can start that app today. Now we're not gonna get as far as Zoom. I would, we'll be thrilled if we get as far as actually making a label, um, but whatever, we can start it, it'll be fun. So let's put this in an aside. And the general structure of the HTML elements in Elm is element as a function, and this is a list of attributes, and this is a list of children. In addition to an aside, I'll have a main, which is main tick, because main is a keyword in Elm no attributes, and then it's ch no, uh, no children yet. To put those together into one HTML element, uh, which is the return type of main, I will need a div. Okay, and then inside main, I would like to have a canvas, and we'll put the diagram there. Uh, we'll just give it a background URL, which is gonna be, I need to give it a style which is in html.attributes, and I can, since I'm gonna use that one a couple times, I'll go ahead and expose it, even though I hate to do that in demos. Um, style, and the argument type here, style accepts a list of tuples of two strings. So key to value, whoops. Key to url elm view dot pung, okay. And when I save this, uh, Elm format kicks in. And Elm format is part of the Elm language system, because let's face it, we don't program in languages, we program in language systems, libraries and build tools and everything all together. 
And uh, part of that in Elm is Elm format, which saves me from arguing over how many spaces. I don't have to argue over spaces versus tabs because it's white space sensitive, so tabs are a syntax error as they should be. Um, but I don't have to argue over spaces or lines either because Elm format makes those decisions for me and I am happy. Okay, so we've got a canvas with a background image. Uh, that might work. It does not work and it tells me that main wanted a list of things, but I gave it a list of list of functions of things, oh my. <laughs> what, what did it, okay, main tick. So main tick, I've given it a list of children or of attributes and then a list of children with attributes, but I forgot to tell the canvas that it doesn't have any children. Better, all right. This should look like something. Okay, good, because I totally cheated and like put CSS in there. Uh, great, we have a diagram. Oh, and what I want to show you about this is that the, um, the actual HTML, you can kind of see that, that winds up in the page is very, very closely mapped to what I output from my main. So there's a div with a main and a canvas and an aside with some text, and that's it. It's just right there. It's such a direct mapping that there's a program out there like HTML to Elm that you can copy your page into and it'll spit out the Elm for you, and you can use that as a start to convert a page to Elm because the, the mapping is very direct, uh, which is nice. Um, Evan didn't intend for the language to output HTML initially, the name Elm comes from elements and you were supposed to say, well, I want this above this to the left of that. And it was supposed to be like nicer than CSS, but then it turned out that what people wanted was uh, CSS and HTML because that's explicit, we know what that does as much as we can know anything about the browser. Um, and so Evan changed it because he's not, he's not writing this language for his own research. He is writing it to make people happy. And by people, I mean JavaScript developers, which is why, which is why we don't have the generic monad. So this is a pretty straightforward transformation. But at the moment, the type of main is, it's actually HTML of, HTML has a type parameter, and that type parameter is the messages that can, can come back from the interactive components in the HTML. I don't have any interactive components. This is a static page, so I can use the type with no instances. I need to bring in the HTML type from the HTML module, and then this uh, is the optional type declaration, which is super helpful when you have an error, and then I put them in there so I see where I'm wrong. Okay. In order to do something more interesting, I need to move from a static page to a program. Like say I wanna be able to like change the diagram that's displayed, enter a URL. I'll need like an input and a button. We'll add the button first because it's easier, but before we can do that, I need to be able to put interactive components in here and like respond to them. I need a program. Um, let's see, commit that, whatever it is. So I'm gonna come back to my editors and run upgrade to beginner program. I like this because it lets me start with the simplest possible thing and like build something and then gradually get more elaborate with it without having to do the same changes over and over in all my wee little projects. And then the program, okay, so it changed my main and now I have a beginner program. Main is still a constant because this is a purely functional program. The constant provides three, um, more pure functions. The model is just uh, the initial value of the application state. The update defines how we, how we modify that state in response to messages, and the view says, based on that state, what should the HTML look like? And then the Elm, Elm will like magically make the browser look like whatever the output of view is. Uh, just like React does, but faster. It's a different implementation. So here's our application state to start with. It's an empty record. Uh, which we give a name to, uh, and then here's our messages. We can do nothing but nothing, and we respond to that by doing nothing. And finally, the, uh, what was our main function is precisely the view now. So now that we have a model coming in, we can make this diagram into application state. Uh, so this will be URL plus, we'll put the model dot diagram URL, and then the close parent. And while we're at it, let's make hello world part of the state, model.message. Okay, so then we have to put those in the state. And sure, I have to give them initial value. Diagram URL is 
that thing, but without the print, but with the quotes. And um, the message was going to be hello world. Oh, I spelled it that time. Okay. And then since we put it in there, we have to change the state or the type definition. That's a string, and this is a, also a string. And something is unhappy, and because Elm format doesn't work, but the compiler will tell me what it is that's unhappy. Hmm, close, I missed a close parent. Oh, look, there's a parent. There's not a parent. I deleted too many. This is fine. We'll just give it one, and then Elm, oh, it's not where it belonged. Nope. Goes here. All right. This is fine. I got that at compile time, which makes me happy. Okay, no change, which is as expected, but we're just, we've got this stuff in the state instead of in um, the hard coded into the view. That's nice of us. And then we can add a button. So in the aside, in addition to the text, let's add an HR with no attributes or children and a button. Um, and the button can have the text of a new diagram. But in order to do anything, it needs to send a message. Oh, look, we've got a message type. This says what our button can send. So I can say events on click, send a message, blah, 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 new diagram, whatever. Um, and then I can make that be part of the message. And this is a union type. So we'll give it a new constructor, a new diagram, la, la, la. I have to respond to that here. New diagram. And then I don't have um, anything to update the diagram URL to, so I can say, give me the model such that the message is new diagram time instead of hello world. Uh, so this is like a record modifier syntax. Kind of the copy constructor. Uh, oh, I forgot to import on click. So here's something that's fun. Um, I can actually, if I pick my favorites, sometimes I get tired of going in and importing them. So one thing I can do is take the build output and parse it and um, <laughs> pipe that to an editor that adds the import, <laughs> which is, is not yet fast. This isn't very alpha. Uh, but what I like about this is that my code modifications are not tied to my my texting tools, so they're not part of the IDE. I can integrate that when, them with Atom, I haven't done that yet, or VI or Emacs, but the concept of how do I work with Elm is outside, just like Elm format is triggered by Atom, but it's not in Atom, so I'm not linked to any one tool. Oh good, it actually worked. Um, I was a little worried when it didn't work earlier. Um, but, so now we have the events thing, yeah, great. Okay, commit that stuff, and we should be able to push the button, but first I have to build, because I don't have any live reload stuff set up. Oh, we have a button, that's great. I'm, I'm happy to see you, button. And if we push it, it says new diagram time. Oh, wow, an interactive app, yay. <laughs> All right, now to make it do something useful, I need to add a text input. Uh, that turns out to be a pain in the butt in Elm. It's, it's five changes. It's just, there's just five places you have to change to add a freaking text input. And rather than make this magic, like a JavaScript library, so many JavaScript libraries do, with like stuff happening behind the scene, I'm just going to generate the code to keep it fully explicit. So we'll call our input name a new diagram, and that'll be good enough. Um, and then let's look at the editor. The editor for add text input is here, and it says, okay, we're gonna add something to the model, that's another editor that I've composed in, which is going to add something to the model type and something to the initial value based on what I put here. And then I'm going to add a message because I need, when we push the new diagram button, we're going to want to update the URL. Well, what are we going to update it to? We have to have that in our application state. But in order to get it in our application state, because we can't just go query that input field and say what's in it. No, that would be accessing the outside world and these are pure functions. So to get it into the state, I have to respond to an event. So, I, so you have to set up the on input event for the text input so that every time I type, it changes my application state which you can do cool things with, like screw with the text input and change it on people while they're typing. 
cool. Um, but more often, you just want access to that later. So we have to add, add a message that can receive it, and that's going to put it in the model such that input name is blah, blah. Um, and then I'm going to import the things that I need just in case. And then I add a function, which let's not look at the JavaScript that generates Elm. Uh, let's just look at the function. It didn't happen. Where is it? Oh, man. Add text model. Yeah, that, I wanted to call it next diagram input. Anyway, this is actually add text input. I was close. OK. So this is going to create a function that, that I can just stick into my view wherever I want the text input. If, you're, if you use Elm all day, you don't feel the need for this kind of thing. But if you only use it in your spare time, and you're like, what all do I have to do to add a text input? And that's five things, plus possibly some imports. I just, I get tired of forgetting the bits. So I really like having it in one place. And also, the other day, I needed an ID on my text input. And I was like, oh, you know, why don't I just add that by default everywhere? So I put it in the editor, and so suddenly, my like, coding standards have changed throughout the project, and every time I do that in the future, it's just there. I would love to be able to do this on my team so that our code stays super uniform, um, and that, that, that when the code is boring, I don't have to respond by adding indirection and more complicated libraries. I can just respond by automating the coding bit. So I like that. All right, it worked this time. Let's see it. Here's a new function. Next diagram input. And I can take that function and I can put it right where I want it before the button and give it the model and we'll save it and build it. And now we'll have a text input. Oh, but this time I'm going to remember to actually do something with it. So now that we have that, um, the next diagram in the model, uh, when, we do, when we push the button, we can say that the diagram URL is the model.next diagram. Great. Um, what the heck time is it? Okay. Um, right. Do, 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 do. We built it. Let's look at it. Okay, we have a text input. I can type in it. I can say, give me the get beginner program architecture. Uh, Elm. Nope. It's a ping. Yay. Okay. So this diagram describes the architecture of our Elm beginner program. Uh, it's beginner because the only interactions we receive are from our components that we created. So here's the initial model. It goes into the update function, which receives messages, modifies the model. That model goes into the view and creates the view. That model also goes back into the update function for the next round with the next message. And uh, messages are created by the user interacting with my components that I created. And doo -doo 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 -doo. Elm wires those back to the update function. So all that wiring is done in the Elm runtime, and my two functions and one constant are completely functional. Um, and repeatable and reproducible, and if you send it the same list of messages, then you get the same output every time. Okay, awesome. Now I want to be able to like label these things as, yo, this is the model, this is the update, this is the view, this is the person. Uh, to do that, I need to, res I need to like, put a text input, like where I click, which means I need to know where I click, which means I need access to something from the outside world. The browser knows where I clicked, but my, my two little components over here don't. So I need to upgrade from a beginner program to a regular advanced Elm program. All right, let's just do the editor. Um, that is over here. So we're going to upgrade to program. This is often the next step in this, as soon as I need subscriptions. Um, this is going to let me subscribe to events from the outside world very explicitly and turn those events into messages that are my message type and then send those through update. And um, we will get farther. OK, great. So let's look at the program. What changed? Here's what changed. Um, I'm, I'm HTMLApp.program. Instead of an initial model, I've got an init constant that returns both a model and a list of commands. Because by upgrading to an advanced program, I gained not just access to subscriptions, which is how I'm going to get the mouse clicks, but to send commands out to the JavaScript. So the JavaScript integration in Elm is a very strict boundary. You can send commands that go out. Um, outside of Elm, like in your HTML, you can, you can like connect the JavaScript to those messages. Um, I'm not going to do that today, but we might get as far as sending a command. Um, 
Also, you can send commands from update. So the type of update has changed, and every uh, place where update returns something now says, here's my model, and do nothing. This is a syntax that turns this into a tuple of the model with a command that does all the things in this list, which is nothing. And I really like it because it's easy to search for. Okay, so our update has changed, our view is identical, there's nothing different about that. But our subscriptions function at the bottle, bottom, here is where we can add mouse clicks. So we need to add mouse.clicks. And um, you know what, I'm, this is gonna be faster if I do it with the editor. Um, so adding mouse clicks is something that I do pretty often. There's a flaw in this editor, which I'm sure everyone here will spot immediately. Subscribe to mouse clicks. Uh, because I need to add the subscription to my subscription function, I need to import the mouse, I need to add a message that, that the, the subscription gets translated into a message of my type, and then I need to add a, something to the model to store the last place that I clicked, and um, <laughs> what did I actually subscribe to? Clicks. Okay, I was close. Um, and I need to, rem oh, and I need to add the mouse to my Elm package.json, which I always forget. So, great for live coding, this will work. Um, the, we can look at the editor for that. As subscribe to mouse clicks, I was close. Yeah, I've got a generic subscribe one, and this, so this specifies all the different things. This is the message we're gonna get. I have to give it an initial value. Um, let's see if that worked. I should have something in my subscriptions. I've got mouse clicks and I've got clicks and um, my message includes click. And with the click, I get the mouse dot position, which is a record of X and Y. Uh, let's commit, build that. And yeah, I approve of this plan. Um, now we're gonna get the clicks, but you're not gonna see anything because we haven't done anything with them, so I better add them to the view. Okay. View, in addition to the canvas, I would like you to show me the last click point, given the model, and I can cheat and paste this in. Last click point model is, give me my favorites. And that is gonna be this one, where I have the style and the position absolute. Um, I, if I brought in Elm CSS, this would be a lot prettier, because this would be typed and I wouldn't have to like two string my X and Y, so I would have to two float them. Um, but that's okay, we're, we're, we're giving a div, we're giving it an absolute position, we're putting in an image with an ID that I have in my CSS, and um, a source, and then a label with some text, which is just gonna show us the value that it thinks I clicked at. Okay, work. Yay, okay. Now you can see the flaw, I haven't clicked yet, and yet there's a click yet, so clearly I should be using a maybe here. And uh, you know, I vaguely tried to implement that this morning, but I didn't, I didn't know. But when I implement it, I will implement it in my editor, and then every time I add mouse clicks, it will be as a maybe, and it will be correct. Um, and yeah, I can click around, awesome. We have four more minutes before I need to get to conclusion. And that means we can probably add a text input. Um, yeah, why not? It's going to have the same problem of not being a maybe, and we should wrap it in one, and I won't get to that today. Uh, but Elm does encourage that. Okay, editor Jess, add another text input. Um, add text input to program input name equals next label. And then after that runs, I'd like to show you the diff. That'll be here. Um, uh, but I didn't commit stuff, so the diff is gonna be useless. Bah. I've added another text input, which is exactly the same operation, and now I just need to put it somewhere. Let's put it here, where is it? It is next label input right here, bam. We'll just stick it in here in place of this label. Next label input. This thing. And that should be good. Oh, build, build, just build. Ah, oh, dun, dun, dun. Oh man. So it wanted this particular, and I gave it a modeled HTML message. Did I pass it the model? I didn't pass it the model. Did I just pass it itself? 
I passed it itself. No wonder it's unhappy. Okay, we have a text. In ah, God, camera. Okay, I can't click in it without without clicking. So, um, I, oh, and it doesn't. So I really need it to put the focus in the text input as soon as I bring up the text input. And, um, and I could set autofocus as true, but trust me, that only works the first time it comes up and not the second and the third and the fourth. Uh, so in order to tell it that I want the focus to be there, I, that's a JavaScript thing. JavaScript does set focus, blah, 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 blah. And I can't do that in my pure functions. I only have expressions. I do not have any statements like set focus. Um, so I'll run another editor. <laughs> and this one is just going to give me um, a way to set the focus. So to set the focus, did I call it set focus? Where's my list of things? Here it is. Um, request focus maybe? Dang it, Jess, what'd you call this thing? Do you see it? I can't hear you. Focus command, thank you, you're right. Oh, awesome, thank you, okay. Focus command. Um, so for this, I'm going to need to send a command out to JavaScript. When I send a command out to JavaScript, um, focus command, come here, there you are. Um, look at all this stuff I have to do. <laughs> so I have to have a message to receive in case of error, and I have to have a message to receive in case of success. This is all very specific, and a lot of commands like totally need those, but in this case, I don't actually care what focus success, I, I'm not going to do anything with them. Um, but for type safety, I have to do all this because this nice dom.focus method uh, is going to give me the task that I need, but the task is just something that you could perform in JavaScript if you sent it a command, and so it's super complicated. But so I have to say task.perform, the dom error, and then the focus success, and I need to import dom, and I need to import task, and I need to make sure that dom is in my, um, JSON, my unpackage.json, because even though it's a transitive dependency of both mouse and HTML, which we already have, you can't call your transitive dependencies in Elm. That would not be explicit. If you want to call something a DOM, you have to declare the DOM. So here I have to add it to the package.json. Um, yeah, the Elm package.json. And finally, I can add this little function so that I don't have to remember how to do this over and over, which makes me happy. Okay, uh, build, oh, and then I need to call it. I probably need to like call the function somewhere. That would help. Uh, and that's going to be uh, when we click, I think. Um, where's the update? At some point, I would like start dividing these up into files and modules by function, not by component. Elm says there is no component. The geographical area of the screen is not the unit of modularization. The function is. Uh, do, 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 do. If we click, we want to set the last click and um, that is going to have the effect of moving the field. So, oh, in our little command list, we want to request focus on our, what did I call that? Next diagram input, I think, in out. It was not an in out. Um, make sure that's correct. No, I, it isn't, it was next label. Where did I put that? Because it was wrong. Next label input, okay. That would have set the focus to the wrong place every time. Build and uh, Chrome and refresh. And now when I click, it doesn't work. That's holy, totally didn't work. Dang it. I don't have time to make it work. Dang it. Okay, I don't know why that didn't work. Um, and I didn't put error handling norm. Um, in real life, I would make that error uh, message update the, this thing over here so that I can see it. That does it. Oh, and while we're here, Elm program dot ping. This is our architecture now. And this is as complicated as Elm programs get with one caveat, you could pass in initial arguments. Um, so there's your init, there's your update. Um, both init and update can send commands to the outside world and the output of that just gets back into the message stream along with the interactions from the people and the subscriptions that you've asked for specifically from the browser. And that's it, that's as complicated as an Elm program gets. And it's all depth from there. The, um, 
in conclusion, I want to give you like some sort of status. Uh, Elm is production ready. You can totally use it. It's got some pretty good tools. Uh, I think we could do more on text editors and IDEs because it's so well typed. Um, and Atomus is part of that. And then the community is really good. There's a Slack with like 5,000 members or something. The Atomus editors you can use now, the currently published ones, which are in here, and they are Clojure, Java, and Python. So if you're working in one of those languages, you could potentially use Atomist editors now by joining the community Slack. And there you can say, hey, Atomist, run this editor on my project, and it'll give you a PR with the changes, which is really cool. And someday, we're going to be able to do those, someday soon, we're going to be able to do those across multiple repositories. Uh, so you can make related changes in multiple repos. Um, and I'll, I'll just be happy when I can publish my own editors and everyone can run them from the command line uh, for testing. So this is exciting, and there's going to be a lot more to that too. You can have reviewers that check um, so that if you've got your coding standards encoded in the editors and someone violates them, you can find out. Uh, yeah, I will push this up to GH Pages um, before I fix the bug, and then maybe y'all can find it, um, if you can find it before I do. And if you want more info, go to elmlang or atomist.com, or the readme at this um, repository. Thank you. And we have one minute for questions. There's one. Uh, it's more not like a question, but uh, a thing for thought. Uh, I, I see really a lot of people putting effort in uh, inventing new languages or bringing Haskell to browser or something similar, uh, like um, strong type systems to browser and uh, making new editors for them. And uh, it takes a lot of effort, in my opinion. Uh, while there is this other thing uh, called LLVM and possibility to compile the bytecode into browser. And with uh, languages like Haskell and uh, Rust, uh, with uh, powerful uh, macro and type supports, um, I wonder if you could use the tools from uh, Haskell or Rust uh, and uh, if somebody has any information if that works uh, and how stable is it, I would love to hear it. Because it really seems uh, the way it's all leading to simply like uh, choose, choose your tools, your stack you wish and uh, have some intermediate uh, that could probably solve a lot of problems, and uh, you 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 wouldn't get uh, languages or tools that are better than the previous one, but you get kind of um, option to choose from. That's a, a thing. Uh, just a thought. Probably. What's your name? Janis. 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 Okay. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> And if anyone here does have an idea about how we can have more compatibilities and choice of tools, um, please find Jans, and you'll have a good conversation. Thank you.